Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. My name is Mark Levine, and I am the Deputy Director of your New York State Association of Counties. On behalf of our President, Jack Marin, and our Executive Director, Stephen Aquario, I want to thank you for joining us this morning for a great webinar on revenue forecasting and cash flow management. The global outbreak of COVID-19 has created an unprecedented slowdown in revenue generating activities that fund government capital and operational costs. Responding to this complex crisis requires a multifaceted approach, including the ability to quickly integrate data sources make accurate multi-level forecasts, look at historic cash flow trends, and provide insights for leaders. We are fortunate to have speakers this morning that will have, that have agreed to lend their ex expertise and time to address how counties can improve their revenue forecasting and cash flow management through these unpredictable times. Before we get started, however, I want to thank our sponsor who is helping to make this webinar possible, the Public Employer Risk Management Association, or PERMA. PERMA is the largest and most successful self-insurance pool for public entities in New York State. They have been providing workers' compensation benefits for over 35 years to more than 550 municipalities who have chosen PERMA to manage their claims and ensure workplace health and safety. NYSAC has been working with PERMA for 10 years now, helping to craft solutions designed to help counties and county workers' compensation pools that are experiencing fiscal pressures. For more information, visit www.perma.org or contact me at NYSAC or contact Leah Demo at ldemo at perma.org. Thank you, PERMA. Our first speaker this morning is Joseph Rolison. He's the CEO and founder of 3 Plus One. Joseph Rolison's multifaceted career in the financial services sector gives him an expansive viewpoint and breadth of knowledge matched by very few. Since his graduation from St. John Fisher College in 1978, Joe's professional journey has taken him from being an account exec at Prudential Bach Securities to his current position as the CEO and co-founder of 3 Plus One. 3 Plus One is a liquidity and analytics and data provider to public entities, higher education, and banking institutions throughout the United States. 3 Plus One is working with several counties in New York and through a recent partnership with NYSAC and NACO is now working with counties in Florida, California, and Wisconsin. Before I turn the mic over to Joe, I just want to mention, if you have questions throughout this presentation, please type them into the question uh, panel on your webinar dashboard and we will take those questions as they come in after the presentations are done. Thank you, and thank you, Joe, for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your time and your expertise, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joe Rulson. Great, Mark, thank you so much, and for everybody that's attending today, I can't tell you how we appreciate having the opportunity to be speaking with you, and you know, as we look, the marketplace just continues to change uh, in front of us. I mean, it's be really evolving beyond our imagination and, and is evolving even quicker given what we've had to go through with COVID-19. To just think that uh, data today is moving at the speed of light eight times over and how we manage it is really up to us. And we're finding that there's greater data than we ever imagined. And at the same point, how we're using it and where we're using it, who would have thought that um, we would have gone from the level of a rotor telephone to today to the um, smartphone. And when you look at that, just consider the following statistics. Right now, there's over 4.5 billion internet users. And each minute, just keep in mind, this is every single minute, 
the following things occur. 300 hours of video are being recorded every minute. 510,000 Facebook comments are being made. Over 4.4 million Facebook like clicks occur. 3.5 billion, which is amazing to me, Google searches occur every single minute. With over 100 million messages being sent, 1.2 million data points are created every single minute, and 21.9 billion text messages occur every minute. Just imagine when you're on the phone and you're texting, you know that you're texting more than just one message, and it occurs very rapidly as the responses come back. As the market continues to set change, so does our methods of how we communicate, how we collect data, and how we transact financially. One of the things that's also exploding in front of us is the use of mobile phones. And just consider that over 65% of all meal emails are read on the mobile phone and over 83% usage is up over 2018. It takes me back to a story of 1992, actually up at the Sagamore on Lake George, when I was meeting with members of Congress and I was told in 1992 that by 2020, and I'm like, I can't even think beyond uh, what it was gonna even be for the year 2000. But by 2020, I'd be able to be on a beach. I'd be able to have a phone in hand that would allow me to see pictures, be able to have videos, be able to communicate, be able to send emails, be able to do files, be able to do everything with one device while I sit on the beach and that the office would no longer exist, that it would mainly be remotely. When you look at it today, going back, it is just amazing as you do look into the future and what has occurred. How we look at all this and impact the ways we forecast revenue and manage cash on hand, especially during these challenging times, how do we do it? Instead of the word being plastic, like we all had heard in the movie of Mrs. Robinson, it all goes down to data, the data you collect on a daily basis. It's thousands of data points you collect daily through each transaction that passes through your hands that of the bank and through the marketplace. Having this knowledge allows you to plan for the unexpected, whether it's a drop in sales tax or other revenues, or the need to borrow to make for budget gaps or other budget purposes, or to put cash to work that otherwise would remain dormant. If we can go to the next slide, please. Cash flow is extremely important of viewing it in three ways and the use of cash. Cash flow is the flow of cash you see over the course of time. It's the ebbs and flow. Liquidity, on the other hand, is the transaction of cash between you and the bank. The actual flow of cash from the time you need it to sending it out the door and the time it takes to process that transaction is the flow of cash. What the marketplace is, marketplace is what determines the value of your cash that flows through your hands and that of your financial institutions. Keep in mind that cash still has value and can generate significant revenue to your bottom line. Please do me a favor, do not fall for the myth that cash has no value right now. When you look at the treasury, you look what the Fed did and you hear, well, rates are at zero or at you know, 25 basis points. That is not what the value is seen in the marketplace. And managing that cash flow is extremely important to your organization and for the daily activities that you carry out and the sources of revenue that come in every single day. Just remember that as you look at your cash flow, you look at your liquidity, you look at that value, there is always a value to that cash that you need to put to work. But it's also important that you look at what is the importance of data, which is the next slide. What do I mean by data? What that is, is every single financial transaction that flows through your entity is information that has values and behaviors. We're seeing more and more data that's coming in by your financial institutions. And all of this data allows you to capture a holistic perspective, while valuable information can allow you to forecast revenue and manage every dollar of cash that you have on hand. 
So you can go to the next slide, please. As you collect this data, it's extremely important for you to look at the holistic picture. What's great about this is that so many times you'll find that within a county and within other entities that may be underneath, whether it be towns or villages or school districts, there are a lot of bank accounts. And so many times you look at what each bank account is and how that money flows through. When you take a look at the holistic perspective, it allows you to see what cash you have on hand, allows you to see through your eyes your cash flow. What are the ebbs and flows? What's the high point? What's the low point? That allows you to manage on a daily basis. But more importantly is when you take all that information together, you see a picture that gives you a much different perspective. So many times when I talk to public entities, they'll say, look, I have no cash. Well, they're looking at one account or maybe two accounts. When you take into account every single bank account and every single financial institution that you have, it allows you to see a full liquidity picture that allows you to see what is it that I have available and what can I do with that given the time period. Once you have that data, once you know what your cash flow is, you can see when do I need that cash and what is the time duration. In this case with this chart, the gray part is showing you what cash you have for cash flow management. That is the dollars that you're going to need that are going to have the highs and the lows before you get to the point that you're going to have what's called the cushion. The cushion is what could you have just in case you are going to maybe fall below like what we're going through with COVID right now. You don't have certain revenues coming in a specific time as expected. The other amounts show what the stress levels are of your cash over the period of time. And what's important by this is that the data, <clears throat> excuse me, allows you to capture what has historically happened. And that allows you to be able to really determine what are the levels of cash I need at any given stress period? In this case, it's showing you that the blue is over a 12 month period, that in a worst case scenario, like a COVID, you would might have to dip in if there's no other sources of revenues that come in. The other levels that go into the different uh, colors go into additional stress years that show you what it is that you're gonna need in case of if there's another year of stress all the way out to five years. This allows you to get a good sense of what cash you have on hand, what cash you have, not what you think you need, but what you actually have. And there's a big difference with that. As you're looking at your cash flow, so many individuals leave cash on hand and uninvested because you think you need it. Not what you actually do, but what you have a comfort level of just saying, I just feel good about having it. When you have this information, you can give this to your financial institutions and they can use this on their side to determine the liquidity and what is the opportunity they have to use that cash on their balance sheet. When they can use that from a banking perspective, they can better plan the use of those dollars and be able to provide you a higher rate of return on the deposits. At the same point, if you have financial advisors, you can give this information to financial advisors and know they can then manage a portfolio based on the time period and time duration of investments in the marketplace. You can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> What's great is that once you have historical data, you can then lead into the future. And this is what I'm sure SAS is gonna talk about and what's so impressive about their systems is that once you get that data and once you know historic, keep in mind, let me just break away for one second. With historic, behavior, with historic data, you can determine behaviors. And keep in mind, every single finance office has different financial behaviors. Why is that? Because the financial behaviors reflect the individuals that are managing the day-to-day -day cash and the cash flow of an entity. So historically, that data can then allow and be applied to then be predict where the future is going. This slide, for example, was actually created three months ago. And it allowed you to look over the period of time of where this entity would be by the time of July. And it actually, even with COVID occurring, 
this information is still extremely accurate. It has over 95% accuracy. But to know that the data has that kind of value, the power of the liquidity allows you to know what cash you have on hand, what are the points in which you may need cash, but what can you put to work over the course of knowing what is going to be my high point of the month, what's going to be my low point. But to know you can use that and have the comfort level to know that the dollars are going to be available to you going forward. And it also will help you determine a number of other um, factors as you um, go through this and look at the behaviors. If you go to the next slide, by using this data, it allows you to have the benefits of liquidity management. And by actively managing your liquidity, which is working with your cash flow and working at the value in the marketplace, you're able to do the following um, as a result. One, you can determine how much cash you have and the level of cash needed to be borrowed for immediate needs. So keep in mind that if you can look out in the future and you can see that you may have some times of budget gap, that allows you to look out way in advance and know exactly what you're gonna need, not what you think you need, but what you will need. And that can be able to have either lower levels of borrowing, greater accuracy to the financial advisor that you're working with, and to know that you're making the most of what it is that you need, but not going out and having more costs involved than necessary. Two, the more information that you have, the more information you can provide to your rating agencies. And by having strong, effective cash management and liquidity management, the rating agencies are looking at this level of analysis more and more, and it does play a part of their ratings for you. And I think that it was at um, S&P and Fitch and Moody's have all given it like a 10% level of importance in terms of looking at credit rating. It can have a bearing. And if you can have a better credit rating, more predictability, the lower that your costs are going to be to borrow. The other benefit is determining the level of cash that, you, again, you view and should be viewed as an asset. The ability to capture a full picture of all dollars allows you to be able to see what levels of stress you have, but to make sure you're putting your money to work that you're not needing. Keep in mind that when you have dollars that are being left on the sideline, please know that, that those dollars have value. And one of the important things I want to remind you is that in the marketplace, there's, you can go out and still put your money to work, whether it be in the bank deposits, whether it be in the state pools, whether it be in um, investing in each other. And that's something I want to really stress is that most of you have in your investment policy statement the ability to go out and invest in municipal bonds. Why not invest in yourself or invest in those entities within your bounds of your, uh, of your county? To be able to invest in yourself, be able to invest in the towns, the school districts, as they go out to raise money and they have to do, whether it be a tax anticipation note, whether a um, revenue anticipation note, or if they have a capital project and they're gonna do a ban, why not take your cash if you have it and instead of necessarily leaving it dormant or keeping it at a low deposit rate, put it to work in those entities that are right there that you're supporting one another. You can use the stress data to allow you to decide what is the level of maturities that you need for your cash, but to know you're helping one another, and that's bringing down what the cost is by having a greater option for those districts uh, within your county, but allows you to earn more at the same time. They're having to pay less costs. You're still earning somewhere that could be as high as 90 to 100 basis points instead of it being at 10 or 20 basis points. The other benefit of having this information and looking at it accurately is to know that you can monitor all bank fees. The banks are extremely important. They have great value and having a strong banking relationship is absolutely essential, especially during these times that you may need to find um, that you have certain services remote that you may need to use. But to know that you can monitor it and keep your fees down and keep competitive is extremely important. And the last part is by having strong cash management and knowing you can forecast your revenue out, gives you a peace of mind. Gives a peace of mind during these times that 
whether we have a local or whether we have a state or a national emergency like we do now, whether it's a natural catastrophe or whether it's um, human cause or health cause, to know that you're able to say, we know we're fine cash wise and we know we will be. It's one last thing that allows you to take and put your focus towards the emergency and knowing that what you're gonna need financially is gonna be right there for you. Today, given the strains of COVID, the ability to see the impact of your revenues, given past experiences and to apply to new challenges can give you the power to manage your cash that will benefit your entity and will benefit those that you're serving. That is, is so important, is your fiduciary responsibility and that of your finance office to know that you are financially sound, that you're putting the best of practices and you're taking what is historic, applying it going forward and knowing you've got that peace of mind of knowing you've done everything possible to bring new sources of revenue to your bottom line while also making sure that you're providing the very best of services to those you're serving. So thank you so much, Mark, and uh, that ends my comments. Thank you, Joe. Great presentation. This webinar and the webinars that we have been presenting over the course of the last few months and going into the next few months, they're all about providing uh, uh, data or information to help counties make more informed, better informed decisions as they serve their public. At this point, I want to, this, this webinar in particular does exactly that. And at this point, I wanna introduce our next speakers who are from SAS. SAS is the leader in analytics. So data analytics, how we can, as counties, make more informed decisions using the data that we have access to. Through innovative software and services, SAS empowers and inspires customers like our counties around the world to transform data into intelligence and better decision making. This point I would like to introduce Andrew Ball, who is taking the lead uh, on this presentation for his team at SAS. Andrew? Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, as I said. Thank you, Mark and Steve Aquaria. We appreciate uh, you guys having us on today. Um, you know, as, as Mark said, we at SAS are, are a leader in analytics and we are looking forward, and I am looking forward to uh, showing some of what, just some of what the capabilities we have uh, to offer. Um, before I immediately came to SAS, I spent 10 years working in the executive chamber in New York State in Governor Cuomo's office. I left as the deputy secretary to the governor, so I have uh, a unique uh, and a complete understanding as to the challenges that local governments face. Um, and frankly, I, I have great appreciation um, for the work that you are doing right now uh, in these trying times. So again, thank you all for taking the time to uh, watch this webinar and participate today. Um, I am proud uh, to introduce my colleagues at SAS um, for the great work that they do. We help in many ways across uh, governments, across the world and across the states, uh, locally and in New York. And I, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Deb Bianco, who will take, it, uh, take you forward on our presentation. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Deb Pianco. I live and work currently in the Washington, D.C. area, but I'm actually originally from New York, having been born in Brooklyn um, and raised in New Jersey, actually. So uh, New York is very close to my heart and my family's heart. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself before we jump in. Um, I have been working for just under 25 years exclusively in the tax industry. And so I had a pretty niche role in my career. I'm not an accountant, I'm not a CPA, I don't do people's taxes for a living. I've had um, a unique career in the sense that my only job in life for the last 25 years has been to build technology solutions for tax agencies. Um, and I spent many years at the DC Office of Tax and Revenue, the District of Columbia Office of Tax and Revenue, as a consultant and, and as the head of application development as a government uh, employee. 
And for those of you who don't know DC, DC, right, is not a state, they're not a city, but they really do function almost more like a city or even a county than they do a state, just sheer, you know, due to their sheer size and the way they operate. So while I haven't personally worked at the county level, I, I do have that experience in DC, um, working with that sort of intimate level of government that I'm hoping brings something to bear on today's conversation. If we wanna to go to the next slide. So as we get started today, I just wanted to take one second to share a bit with the group about SAS for those of you listening who may not be familiar with us as a company. And so we always joke internally anyway that SAS is probably the biggest company you have never heard of. Uh, you won't see us in TV commercials. Uh, you will not see us on big billboards in the airport. Uh, we'd rather spend our money on research and development than advertising but we are the largest privately held software company in the world. And with just over $3 billion a year of revenue and tens of thousands of clients all over the world. If you can think of the name of a business or a commercial business or a government agency in your head right now, chances are that they are our client in some way. So everyone from Nike to the New York Mets, 1-800-Flowers, Mercedes-Benz, General Motors, if you can think of it, they're probably our client, but we also um, do tons of work with government agencies. Because I work in the tax space, my, my focus tends to be in the tax area where our clients are the IRS, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, uh, Belgium tax, Japan tax, again, you know, a lot of big names, but we also do work with much smaller government agencies, like uh, about 30 or 40 U.S. states and, and tons of, of county level governments who are beginning to use analytics to help optimize um, what they do. Um, we've been, those clients have been using SAS for 40 years. Oh, you know, SAS has been around for over 40 years. SAS is a specialty company. And we do one thing. So we're not a generalist software company. We're a bit different than the Accentures of the world or the Deloitte's of the world. You know, you can't hire us to build anything under the sun. We do one thing and that thing is analytics. Um, what is analytics? It's building COTS software tools. So commercial off the shelf shrink wrap software tools that are specifically designed to access and cleanse big data or little data, you know, if you're talking at the county level, it doesn't always have to be huge data. And we use it to look for trends, patterns, and make predictions in that data. And so I, I truly believe we do it the best, and we've certainly been doing it the longest. We help our clients with everything from fraud detection to facial recognition, all the way to inventory optimization and customer engagement. But what we're intending to focus on exclusively today is the application of those sorts of machine learning and advanced analytical techniques to the field of forecasting. And so whether it's forecasting tax revenues or the number of resources you need in your call centers, we're hoping that today's session will shed some light on what our customers are doing with some of these advanced techniques to make, their, to make your forecasts more accurate and honestly, uh, hopefully less painful to create in the first place. And so with that, we can go to the next slide. Obviously here, we're just showing how we're doing tons of work in New York State and um, across many different functions, many of which I've already spoken about. And I think if there are any questions about any work we've done outside of the forecasting space in New York State, we're certainly happy to answer those at the end. We can go to the next slide. And I think uh, I wanted to turn it over to one of my colleagues, Joe Zilka, who's a talented engineer in SAS. Uh, would you like to take it over from here, Joe? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Deb. Can you all hear me okay? Sure can. All right, great. Uh, yeah, again, as Debbie said, my name is Joe Zilka. I'm a, a senior manager of government solutions at SAS. I've been supporting uh, SAS in the state and local government space for the last 20 years, working with folks like Debbie as we apply SAS's core capabilities to solving business problems in government. One of the things that we have seen with the COVID uh, pandemic, of course, is, is disruption. And we've kind of broken it down to do uh, three different phases, if you will. Uh, initially, as the, as the pandemic broke, it was all about responding to the crisis, understanding situational awareness. Uh, where might revenues, where might we have revenue shortfalls, uh, for example? 
uh, understanding how we need to respond and adjust and mitigate those disruptions uh, for our citizens. The second phase is the recovery phase, right? So let's take our organization, understand what we might need to rebuild in order to operate uh, sort of with the new normal. Uh, what does that mean for revenue impact? Uh, and we'll see very shortly. Lastly is reimagine, right? As we've kind of experienced this disruption, uh, how do we prepare for our organization, move into the future uh, and be a bit more resilient when uh, perhaps additional disruptions or future disruptions uh, happen uh, in our space or in our jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So, you know, what we've seen the challenge with the government organizations that we've been working with is, is you know, and, and the impact on the ability to fully understand uh, current and future revenue streams, right? Generally speaking, depending on jurisdiction, 30 to 40% of government revenues can be associated with tax, with, with sales and consumption taxes, use taxes. You know, each jurisdiction, of course, can be very different, but it st still certainly amounts to a large component of government revenue. Uh, some counties in New York collect hundreds of millions of dollars in sales taxes, right? So, you know, just a 10% decrease in that amounts to tens of millions of dollars uh, in government funds. I'm sure I don't need to point that out here, as you're all probably likely aware. Uh, but what I think governments really, the challenge is they like to be more comfortable with decisions that they are being urged to make, uh, whether it's tax payment flexibility, uh, delaying the filing of taxes, delaying license renewal fees, understanding how we provide relief at potentially the cost of incoming uh, uh, dollars uh, to pay for the service that we must provide. These government organizations need to quickly integrate data that may now be relevant, right? So the crisis has created a situation that these agencies uh, had not experienced before. Uh, you know, I think Joe pointed out that, you know, SAS does a great job of doing econometric time series fact, uh, forecasting, right? Looking at our historical data and projecting what that would be in the future. However, when you've got a significant disruption like COVID-19, some of those algorithms uh, sort of fly out the window, right? We need to look at new data sources, which may include uh, economic indicators or healthcare response data. Where and how the disease is spreading can provide new clues to understanding the impact on revenues. As we progress toward recovery, where and how stimulus funds are spent can and will have an impact on revenue generation activities. Uh, epidemiological model outputs provide us with information on peak infection days or how long the curve uh, will be and, and how that impacts economic activity. So integrating that newly relevant data is a challenge for some organizations. Understanding what recently happened as well as the, uh, what has recently happened uh, in the now, right? We often uh, hear the infection hotspots, right? I'll propose the concept with uh, associated revenue cold spots, right? Drops in government revenue streams due to COVID-19. Which areas, which sectors are most impacted, right? Do local variations and in infections impact uh, industries uh, and jurisdictions differently? Thirdly, which revenue streams are impacted and, and, and what's the magnitude of that impact, right? We've seen how unemployment claims skyrocket with shelter in place orders and businesses closing up shop. How can we quantify future revenue changes related to that activity? Uh, organizations lack scenario analysis capabilities, right? Especially when we look uh, at other data as potential indicators uh, of that revenue streams. And we'll get a look at a demonstration here uh, shortly about how we can do some of that scenario analysis, uh, what if analysis, if you will. Uh, and lastly, you know, what's the impact of wide reaching policy decisions, right? As governments grapple with relief options, uh, how will that affect our funding? Governments are giving money, but what happens when we're taking less or delay the payments associated uh, with that? Next slide, please. So analytics can provide the kind of information and rapid insights needed to understand the impact of COVID-19 crisis as well as help plan for the future, right? Quickly ingesting and preparing new internal data sources that you all may have access to or external data sets, maybe third-party data sets to corroborate or complement data sources that are already in use. You know, we mentioned using health response data, government plan to reopen by industry. Uh, what's essential, what's not, what, what is not classified as essential. Uh, and that can certainly vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, right? 
uh, incorporating and, and process those input, inputs quickly uh, to be used in analysis to understand uh, the impact. Uh, we analyze and visualize the who's, the what's, and the where's of the revenue impact, right? I mentioned before, what are those cold spots? Agencies without large budgets may lack significant platform for revenue forecasting uh, to, to better understand how COVID-19 may impact them now uh, or in the future. Uh, even, you know, small licensing agencies rely on fees to operate their, their businesses. Right, so uh, certainly a significant impact for organizations that really rely on, on license fees. Uh, SAS provides some of the visual scenario analysis to help find data that may be correlated and used as an underlying factor in those what if scenarios. We'll talk a little bit about underlying factors uh, when we go through some of the slides. Uh, but for instance, how can we use vehicle miles traveled and fuel efficiencies for vehicles to help us understand the fuel tax? Right? What's the fuel tax consumption and what's the fuel tax revenues that we might rely on? Uh, so using some of those previously uh, underutilized sources of information uh, as a proxy to help us understand revenues. Uh, SAS, is, I think Deb mentioned, provide advanced analytical forecasting capabilities in the economic time series forecasting arena, um, uh, helping organizations uh, accelerate their model development and enhancements to those models as they add new data sources. For instance, uh, while unemployment may not have been a really significant underlying parameter with respect to sales tax in the past, uh, with such a significant rise in unemployment, that may have a certainly a significant impact in sales taxes and can be potentially used as an indicator. And lastly, uh, allowing organizations to easily test the impacts of proposed policy decisions through an interactive interface uh, adjustments to filing rules, tax policy, or, or even expected income can be applied to previous data and executed on a large number of underlying transactions to come up with a more exact, uh, exact projection uh, of what those forecasts might be. Uh, next slide, please. So to kind of go through that, I'm going to just quickly step, step through some slides uh, of a demonstration on trend analysis and scenarios. Uh, and again, this will be related on, on gas tax. Uh, next slide. So a lot of uh, analytics, advanced analytics, forecasting, uh, starts off with a little bit of a hypothesizing, right? And I'll talk about this at the end and the importance of understanding the significant indicators or underlying values that be, can be correlated to a problem. Uh, but here, revenue from fuel tax decreased due to less vehicle miles traveled. Pretty logical hypothesis, very simple to understand. So what we've done is, you know, how do we capture data in a more timely fashion that's going to help us understand activity related to vehicle miles traveled? So streetlight data provides vehicle miles traveled by county, uh, and it's updated three times per week, right? So we get some pretty timely information into fuel consumption, right? So we can understand what the cost of fuel is in a particular state. You can get gas prices from places like AAA or Gas Buddy use those as part of the mathematical equation. Uh, we understand what the fuel taxes are by state, right? That's very simple uh, to come up with. Uh, and lastly, looking at average miles per gallon by vehicle type, uh, and maybe even by county if we can. Now we don't necessarily get vehicle miles by vehicle type, uh, but we can certainly use it to weigh fuel efficiencies uh, potentially within our jurisdiction to better understand, in this case, what the fuel tax might be and what the revenues with associated fuel tax. Uh, next slide. So putting that into the, uh, you know, using the analytics, uh, being able to understand the correlations and what those variables weightings may be in fuel tax. Here we get a first look at the overview tab, shows current revenue shortfall compared to a similar time period in January. Uh, you could certainly use year over year or same month to same month data as well. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, this demonstration is showing us what our baseline is compared to a January time period uh, with the current time period of, of March uh, through May. Uh, we see a reduction in 394 billion miles US wide, which can be calculated to a $5 billion reduction in fuel taxes. Next slide. Uh, we can drill down to a state level and ultimately, since we do get data by county, look at this by county. Uh, so here, uh, county level, which we might uh, obviously be interested in, we've got North Carolina highlighted in this particular demonstration. Wake County uh, has seen a decrease 
uh, in miles, uh, a 54% decrease in vehicle miles traveled, and thus a $28 million decrease projected fuel tax shortfall for that particular jurisdiction. So here we get some very simple maps and charts that we're comparing some previous periods uh, to the current situation. Next slide. Uh, here we've got a line chart that shows us the trend of revenue change by day. As I mentioned, we're getting data every three days and it is daily vehicle miles traveled. So very simply, we can plot and see some weekly cycles that would be related to people going to work, uh, people staying at home on weekends. Um, but here again, we see a significant drop off uh, from March activity uh, through the activity of April and May. Uh, next slide. Again, this is quickly going to just show by county some of the, uh, the most impacted counties in terms of fuel tax shortfall as well as decreases uh, in vehicle miles traveled. Uh, Graham County, uh, which is at the very top or on the very right hand side of the fuel tax shortfall, had the least impact with respect to vehicle miles traveled. Union County had one of the highest impacts with respect to decreases in vehicle miles traveled. Uh, and subsequent fuel tax shortfalls. Uh, here I've got some check boxes that allow me to navigate by state, uh, but again, since we do have county data, uh, we can certainly make this a much more drillable chart, which allows us to drill into the counties. Uh, next slide. Uh, we'll skip this one. We'll go one more slide, please. Thank you. So here's where we start to, where the analytics really start to come into play, right? We know obviously the vehicle miles travel can be correlated to the fuel tax shortfall, uh, in this case, because it's a bit of an arithmetic equation, right? Uh, there are other situations where we might look at data that is correlated, but not necessarily a mathematical equation that equates to something like a revenue stream or tax shortfall or increase. Um, you know, we talked about retail activity as being a potential indicator of sales tax. Uh, hotel occupancy rates obviously would have an impact on hotel taxes. All right, so here we can look at those lines side by side uh, and click down and drill down into our jurisdictions. But next slide, please. One of the things we can afford is some of the what is what if calculations, right? If I want to say estimate that there will be an increase in vehicle miles traveled or whatever our underlying factor is, right? I can go to those forecasted out periods and I could change those underlying factors, increase or decrease. Uh, to get a projection of the gas tax, right? Under the covers, there's a, a model here, a forecasting model, where those correlated factors have an impact on the metric we're trying to forecast. So now, um, quickly incorporating new, for, new sources of data, uh, under, identifying which underlying factors are significant indicators, and being able to drag and drop and do what if forecasting with those significant indicators can help me understand more exactly what the forecasted revenue streams may be. Again, here we've, gas tax, we've used gas tax as a simple example, uh, but again, looking at different economic indicators, unemployment rates, hotel occupancy rates, even things like home listings may, may help us understand uh, property values. Next slide, please. So again, um, we've seen some easy to understand examples of uh, the way to use data to extrapolate revenue, in this case, gas taxes, looking at data in maps and charts and trend lines. Uh, but again, I think the important thing here is highlighting the what if scenario analysis that's available for a non-data scientist to consume this information and leverage data uh, to help us make revenue, uh, revenue decisions. Um, I think we'll look for qu some questions at the end, uh, but at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby Gutierrez uh, so he can talk about property valuation. Bobby? Thanks, Joe. Can everybody hear me? So, um, okay, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to talk a little bit about here was just um, a project that we did for Wake County, North Carolina on doing property valuation for the year 2020. And I wanted to sort of frame this as an example where because we used a machine learning approach, even though you know our original motivation was was elsewhere, using a machine learning approach or artificial intelligence allowed us to build an environment where we were easily able to pivot the analysis over to, you know, now with COVID-19 and the concept of economic recession and recovery, 
um, the fact that we had this system in place made that made that very possible to pivot. And so, uh, next slide, please. So um, back in about 2018, uh, we were approached by Wake County, North Carolina, a county of 1.1 million uh, residences and about 300,000 residential properties. Um, they do a revaluation of their properties for property tax purposes every four years. And their next revaluation was taking place in 2020. And so they approached us with a project that said, can you use our data from our computer aided mass appraisal system and uh, the public data on property sales and, and their sell prices, can you use that to formulate a system that is able to evaluate property for us? Now, um, we don't want you to replace our system completely. What we're looking for is a completely independent valuation based on the data only that is free of any of the 40 years of accumulated assessor bias we've had and uh, sort of a verification of our cost-based formula or identification of where that formula needs to be modified. And so we just we did just that. We took their their CAMA data sets or their CAMA database. We took sales data, and by using the concepts of machine learning and AI in our SAS via platform, we were able to build a valuation system that could value property um, for all properties in Wake County and do that at any point in time. Uh, next slide, please. And so the net effect of this was that we were able to build using SAS Visual Analytics, another one of our products, a dashboard that Wake County assessors could log into every day that would show side by side what their current working assessment was for the 2020 year valuation next to what our machine learning artificial intelligence uh, value is. And so in this case, um, you know, they were able to go neighborhood by neighborhood and, um, you know, these points represent homes and they're color coded. Green are where our values were in agreement and uh, shades of red are where the uh, Wake County valuation was uh, bigger than our SAS independent valuation and shades of blue were is just the opposite. So um, we had this product in place for about two years and Wake County was very happy with the product. Uh, like I said, they used our um, product mainly for independent verification, um, identification of patterns where their cost-based formula needed to be updated, um, and also the identification of certain neighborhoods where uh, a review of the data, you know, needed to be done so that uh, their working valuations could be more in line with what the current market was, was saying that they should be. Next slide, please. So um, long story short, the, the project was a, was a big success. Um, as of 2020, uh, in January, where they released their notices and everything was, was done using our product, um, they are the only county, um, as of that time, they were the only county in the country that was using machine learning or artificial intelligence as part of their assessment process. Um, and then one of the things they've also been able to do since 2020 is that um, because they were under contract with us and because they had this product that uh, was updating on a daily basis using current sales data what the value properties were um, in Wake County, they were able to pivot this product um, you know, at the beginning of the year from a tool that they used every day to help them with their assessments to a tool that was able to look at what the performance was of their 2020 assessments when paired with what the sales have taken place since then. And so, you know, we were able to really quickly, because we had all the analytics underneath and because they use machine learning, was able to pivot this into a performance. And so this dashboard sort of shows um, what the metrics are, you know, were the SAS-based model or the model that um, Wake County ended up using. And, you know, this shows every property that has sold since 2020 when the, when the assessments were released and shows that for the most part, 80% of the time, the assessments were right on. Um, it can identify properties where the sale price didn't agree with the assessment. They can focus in on that. Their summary statistics up there show that our metrics are, are really, really good. Wake County's metrics are, are pretty phenomenal based on our model that they were able to leverage. Um, they've been very happy with the product. Um, but the other thing was, you know, because we use machine learning and because machine learning does not make any pre preconceived notions about 
how property should be valued in, in relation to the characteristics of that property. When COVID-19 hit in March, uh, the model was able to be used to pivot um, from a sort of revaluation kind of analysis to an economic forecast. So in other words, because um, the machine learning, you know, lets the data speak for itself, when COVID happened, there might have been changes to a, you know, if you were doing this with a normal statistical model, you would have had to go in there and say, okay, well, now the game has changed. What has happened? What is different? Uh, but with machine learning, that all happens automatically because the new data is processed and it's able to detect what the new factors are in important automatically. And so um, with the next slide, please. Because of this, we were able to, again, when COVID-19 hit, be able to pivot this from a um, you know property by property assessment of what the values of the of the of the property were to sort of an overall county wide assessment. And so in this case, um, Wake County contacted us, contacted contacted us and said, well, now since you can track properties over time, can you tell us sort of what the average home value is during these days versus what you would expect if current trends were um, you know, over the previous four years were done. And so we were able to do comparative plots of sort of our, uh, in blue, what our um, machine learning says the values of the properties are versus the red, which is what they would have been in a normal non-COVID type year. And so you can see uh, sort of this effect since COVID values have sort of flattened out um, and then not undergone the normal springtime buying season sort of increase bump up. And we did this not just with home values, but we did this with sale volumes, et cetera. Um, but this was possible because of machine learning, because like I said, uh, there was not a lot of um, sort of, you know, there was not a lot of new analysis that had to be performed with this. We were just able to um, look at the data coming in on the post COVID home sales um, and the, you know, sale prices and see what was happening with this. And the model was able to pick up the trend and say, okay, uh, sales are a little bit slow. Um, home values are stagnating a little bit. There was a, and we were able to do this. And and again, this kind of just showed the agility that uh, machine learning and SaaS analytics, not just our analytics, but our visualization products, uh, were able to sort of go with the times and be able to adjust uh, things in the new economic situation that we're in right now. Um, and that's pretty much what I wanted to say on property valuation. I think I'll turn it back over to Deb or Joe um, to turn to moderate the questions. Thanks, Bobby. Um, as, as we're wrapping things up here, I just, a, a couple of questions came to me while you guys were talking and they relate really closely back to things that I keep hearing from our clients, our tax clients. So I wanted to pose two questions, one to each of you as we conclude to get your opinion um, on, on something. Um, so I'll start with Joe. When I talk to tax agencies around the world, one of the common things I hear is, hey, SAS, this stuff is really cool, but we don't have data scientists on our staff. You know, they're, even if you can find them, they're impossible to hire and keep. Um, they're also, you know, hey, Deb, we, ha we are doing forecasts. We've, we've got, you know, we've got programmers who are doing our forecasts for us, but they're retiring. You know, so we deal with a lot of government agencies who have one or two people who have been doing this for the, you know, the past 20, 30 years. Now they're ending their careers and these organizations are really have their backs up against the wall. So what would you say to a government agency that's either can't hire these kind of people or has them and they're about to lose them and they're and they're kind of nervous? What, what do you say about that particular challenge, Joe? Yeah, th thanks, Deb. So, and there are two distinct points there, right? It's one is having the internal capability and two is you're losing the internal capability. Um, you know, what I think is, you know, analytics have come a long way and, you know, since, you know, web-based reporting and business intelligence and now advanced analytics have really gone mainstream um, from an end user perspective, right? There's interfaces, visual interfaces that allow you to point and click your way through even some of the more advanced analytical procedures. Now there's a lot of knobs and dials behind the scenes that a data scientist is gonna be able to manipulate and modify. Uh, but I think, you know, in lieu of having uh, maybe some high-end talent, there, there, are, there is the ability to create good enough, good, enough, good enough forecasts, right? And I think it's a lot better than what some organizations are doing now. 
uh, without being able to accurately forecast at all or, or, or going th through some relatively manual processes with, with spreadsheets, right? So there's some, certainly some capability for everyone uh, there, whether you're a, a novice or even the experienced data scientist. Secondly is, uh, you know, as you know, folks have already created some models and forecasting, and there are ways to incorporate that institutional knowledge from those folks who may be leaving the organization into these tools. Uh, there's ways to, um, you know, it's, it's pretty open and able to leverage, uh, you know, open source models or even built SaaS models into the process. Uh, and then, you know, along with that, uh, you know, as SaaS, you know, was originally a software company, uh, we're also a services company. So there's a couple different jurisdictions where, you know, we've used our staff expertise to supplement uh, and augment uh, uh, you know, the, the jurisdictions and their, their, their tax and, and their research analysts in order to help them understand revenue impacts, right? So, uh, you know, it's not just software. There's, there, there's organizations that, uh, like SAS that can certainly help from a services perspective that understand the tax world, uh, that understand uh, data science and machine learning uh, to apply these technologies. Thanks a lot, Joe. I appreciate it. So you're saying that, you know, if you've got the resources in-house, there are better tools to do it than there were 20 years ago, but if you don't have the resources, there are certainly companies like SAS that can that can do quite a bit of hand-holding if needed. Thank you for that. Um, and my last question is to Bobby. Um, it's clear from the slides that you showed, you know, the Wake County demonstration, how far we've come in our ability to make accurate statistical predictions um, due to the advances in technology, particularly you talked about machine learning. Can you talk a bit about the differences between the way forecasts used to be done, let's say 10 or even 20, 30 years ago, and the advancements that you're seeing today with machine learning? And I guess the way to summarize my question, to make it simple, is how would you advise people who may have been doing their forecasts the same way for the last 20 years? Should they just stay the course or should they consider new approaches as they move forward? Well, I mean, I, I think there's there's two aspects to that. I, I would advise that they consider new approaches because, you know, for example, with Wake County, the one of the things they wanted to use machine learning for was to sort of see um, by leveraging new technology what was possible and what kind of performance metrics was out there, you know, and what did the data have to offer that they might have been missing out on and what they could shoot for. And they found out very early on that there was there was a lot of stuff that machine learning, a lot of uh, data and a lot of information and a lot of featureability that was in the cracks that they were not exploiting and that, they, that if they used machine learning, they could exploit it and get a performance gain. Um, and then the other thing is that um, machine learning, because it's an unsupervised, uh, there's no model that a data analyst has to tend. Um, so the machine learning is able to, you know, once you get a system in place that you're able to have uh, more agility with current times and with current conditions and, you know, should things change, uh, the machine learning can bring new insights into that change without having a, a, a classical data analyst trying to uh, posit what possible changes may have happened. And so I think there's a lack of supervision with these models that's very, uh, very advantageous, especially in changing conditions. So if I'm the head of a county government or I'm the CIO of a county government or the head of the forecasts, I don't, is it true that, you know, I as a CIO, I don't necessarily need to know about machine learning. I don't even need to know what to even ask a company like SAS to do for me. But all I need to know necessarily is that I wish we could do this better. And hey, Bobby, could you come look at what we're doing and make some suggestions? Is, is that how a county like Wake came to engage with SAS? I mean, it wasn't the case that Wake kind of knew exactly what they wanted from SAS and wrote it on a piece of paper. It was it was more of a collaboration, right? Right, right. And 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 one of the biggest uh, adv advantages with property assessors is that they, they have a very standard set of metrics that measures how well their models perform and their valuations, and it's very objective. And so what we were able to demonstrate at a very early time is that by using the same performance metrics, we were able to sort of show them what what kind of you know performance we could get. And so it it sort of said, okay, this is possible. And then they said, okay, well, how? 
And then what we're able to do is pair our approach with their approach and to try to sort of get a, um, a system in place where they could take full advantage of our machine learning without having to um, sort of change anything really big with you know, without having to make sort of this big system wide change to, to their current valuation system and their camera system. And you can do all this even if your data is not completely perfect, right? Because I've never worked for an agency, a government agency that had perfect data ever, in spite of what yeah, they're Yeah, it, it, it can certainly uh, work with non imperfect data also. All right. Thanks, Bobby. So I think I think this is on the SAS side of the house. Happy to turn it back over to NYSAC. Thank you very much, Deb and Bobby and Joe and Andrew. And thank you to Joe Rulison. We're up at the hour right now, so uh, and, and um, we have very few questions that I think that we will take by email at this point. And if anybody on the line has a question, please submit them to Jeanette at NYSAC. It's jstanziano at nysac.org. You will get an email from her this afternoon and you can respond to that with a question and we will submit those questions to the presenters and get those out to all webinar registrants. So again, thank you for joining us. I also want to thank PERMA again for sponsoring this webinar. We appreciate their underwriting and their uh, support for our county members across the state. Thank you to SAS. Thank you to 3 Plus 1. Enjoy your day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thanks.